Christian greetings to you and welcome to the midweek Bible study from the First Christian Church in Galax, Virginia. I'm Glenn Sage, interim pastor, and we are continuing with a series of studies in the book of Ecclesiastes, which uh, literally is translated uh, the words of the preacher. We uh, are now on the uh, sixth chapter of Ecclesiastes. And today we're going to begin with verse 1 and continue through verse 12, which is the full chapter. As we look at it, this is a rather uh, depressing narrative from uh, Solomon, who is currently king of Israel, when he penned these words. And we're going to uh, see why it's so depressing in a way, but it's important to understand that this is midpoint in his journey. He's uh, struggling with the meaning of life and death and life hereafter. And uh, so this, uh, this is an enlightening piece, piece of, uh, of scripture that uh, teaches us uh, where uh, values really should be placed in the life of the, of the Christian. And as we uh, look at uh, this portion of scripture, in verse 1 it says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. So uh, Solomon is speaking from experience here. This really is a good description of who and what he is at this point in his life. But uh, he's talking about an evil, which is a common evil. And this, uh, this evil is uh, to be consumed uh, with the... Uh, with the thought of wealth and, and satisfaction in life. And uh, this, this certainly is a picture of, of where he is at this point. And he says, And a man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul, of all power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity that he desireth, yet God give him not, and it is an evil disease. And so uh, he is now describing a man that is well-rounded in uh, uh, all things that he might like or think that he likes, and uh, that is uh, wealth. He's given riches, wealth, and honor uh, so that uh, his soul doesn't desire anything. So uh, we would assume that that would be a position of of uh, being happy. Uh, if anything that our heart's desire was available to us, it was at our fingertips. But yet here uh, Solomon is calling this uh, a vain point in life. Uh, vanity is uh, devoid of, of worth and meaning. So in verse 3 he says, If a man begot a hundred children and lived many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not lifted with good, filled with good, and also that he hath no burial. I say that an untimely birth is better than he. So uh, he really is describing here himself uh, in, a, in a very clear way. Uh, Solomon, uh, at this point in his life, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So he had, um, he had a thousand women that was available to him any time he desired. So it would be very easy for him to have a hundred children or even a thousand children. So here he's talking about a man who would have a hundred children in his life with multiple wives. Uh, polygamy was uh, still a practice at this point. It was a, a practice of his father, David, but uh, not nearly to the point that it was for Solomon. There were political reasons behind all of his marriages, and uh, one of that was to, uh, to create a state of peace for Israel with uh, surrounding nations. If he married a king's daughter from some kingdom that bordered uh, Israel or was close by, then uh, the king would be far less likely to attack Israel uh, because he would also be putting one of his own children at risk. And so uh, rather than signing a bunch of peace treaties, 
uh, the uh, the kings and the uh, those who rule nations would uh, solidify their their peace by uh, entering into uh, uh, into uh, gifted into approved marriages uh, of their children. So uh, he uh, he had a thousand uh, a thousand women that he could have had children by, but uh, having all these children did not give him a state of peace and satisfaction. Uh, so he said, if you have lots of children, a hundred, and your days upon the earth were many. And if they were not filled with good, and also if you had no burial, meaning that you didn't die early, uh, that uh, uh, that if you did not do good, if your life wasn't filled with good, it would have been better for you if you never had been born, if you had an untimely birth, uh, that's, that it, that is better than he who had no goodness in his life. So. Uh, Really, uh, Solomon is saying again that things do not satisfy. Uh, even uh, relationships without God and to, uh, uh, to not have a, a state of um, well-being and peace within your lives uh, was, was, an empty, uh, was an empty life. So uh, then in verse 4 he says, For he cometh in with vanity, and he departeth in darkness. So a man who has experienced wealth and prosperity and riches and all these things that are mentioned in verse 2, and he doesn't have goodness in his life, then uh, uh, he, he comes in in a vain way. His life has no meaning from, it, from the beginning, and he goes out into darkness. So now he is um, he's talking some about the afterlife and in verses that shall follow, he gets more in into this. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, often spoke about the afterlife of those who were unredeemed as uh, going into outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And here Solomon talks about this state of, of uh, passing from uh, entering into this world vain and departed in darkness, even though he'd lived many years and had a hundred children, uh, his life was, was still vain. In verse 5, he says, Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor, no, nor knoweth anything that, is, that hath more rest uh, than the other. So uh, he's saying, rich or poor, we all have common experiences. And these can be fulfilling, or they might not be fulfilling, uh, based on uh, ba based on the quality of life that you enjoy. So here in verse six, he begins to deal a little more with the afterlife. He said, "Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place." So he sees the afterlife as uh, one place to go. Basically, uh, he's talking about the grave, or he is talking about um, uh, the afterlife as de is described in various languages in the New Testament, meaning a little different place. Uh, these are such places as, uh, as uh, Hades, or uh, Sheol, or uh, Gehenna, or as Jesus expressed, into outer darkness. So uh, uh, one of the pictures that we have uh, that Jesus talked about in Luke's gospel was uh, the abode of two different people who were at the opposite end of the spectrum as far as wealth. Uh, one man was uh, extremely wealthy, and he, as the scripture describes, fared sumptuously every day. So there was never want or a perceived need within his life. He, he fared sumptuously. There was an abundance that surrounded him. But he had uh, someone that he paid little or no attention to, uh, whose name was Lazarus, who uh, uh, laid at the uh, rich man's table and desired the crumbs that fell from his table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his wounds. 
So this man uh, was not perceptive of the needs of others. All he was focused on was his own needs, his own desires, his own life. And here was a person who was in need, who was ever within sight of him there at his table. He, uh, uh, this may not have literally been that he laid under the table waiting for crumbs to fall off, but he was fed from the scraps of this man's table and was glad to get the scraps. And then there was a common denominator that came into both of their lives. And uh, this common denominator was death. Both of them experienced death and it, it, it appears as though their death came very closely together. And the rich man, uh, Jesus said, died. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. Now this, uh, this abode of this rich man uh, was in a fiery hell. And uh, this is described because he said, for I am tormented in these flames. And then within sight where he could see over beyond this great gulf that was fixed, this separation, this place that uh, divided uh, the good from the bad. Uh, and he could look over there and he saw the man who desired crumbs that fell from his table. And he knew his name. He called his name. And he said, uh, would you send Lazarus that he might dip his finger in water? For I am tormented in these flames. Now the word dip, the word there is babto, which means a singular dip. So he was desirous at this point in his existence, in his life after death, to have somebody come and just gather uh, enough moisture that he could gather on the, uh, uh, the finger, one finger, dip his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in these flames. Now in life, he had everything uh, at his doorstep. He had everything that he could desire, but now life has departed and he's, he's went over into this place where there were basically what we might refer to as two chambers or two locations. Uh, one was, was into Abraham's bosom, which is also described as paradise. The, the, the poor man passed into paradise and he passed into Gehenna fire, hell fire, and was tormented in the flames of this place where he was. And uh, as he was there, he said, would you have Lazarus to do this? And uh, Father Abraham, which is representative of God, said, uh, son, remember in this life, thou hast thou had the good things and Lazarus the evil. Now he is comforted and you are tormented in these flames. And besides this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that you cannot leave where you are. You're, you're, you're there. You're there and there's no escape for you. You can't come over to the other side to where Lazarus is, nor can Lazarus come to you. And so the rich man recognized there was no hope for him. So he began to petition on behalf of members of his household. He said, well, Father Abraham, would you send Lazarus that he might warn my five brethren that they might flee this awful place? Well, as he was described earlier in Luke, uh, he wasn't too concerned about anyone. He, he was just enjoying feasting and, and having everything that his heart desired. And now he's arrived at a point where he is in misery and there's no comfort for him. And there's not to be any comfort for him. And so he cries out uh, in, uh, uh, in a, a petition to send Lazarus back to the earth to talk to his five brothers so that they would recognize that they were on the same course. And uh, perhaps some of his brothers even inherited uh, parts of his estate or whatever, but they were living in comfort. And he didn't want them to come to that place. So he developed compassion after this life, after it was too late. 
And uh, so then uh, the voice of Father Abraham speaks out and said, Son, remember, in this life thou hadest the good things and Lazarus the evil. And then he went on to, uh, to uh, tell him, he, uh, uh, he said that uh, uh, they have Moses and the prophets. So uh, Jesus was describing not a parable, because in all the parables that Jesus ever used, he never used a personal name. He just used a, uh, a, a pronoun for uh, whoever the person was. But in this particular passage of scripture, as he talked about the afterlife, he used Lazarus' name because Lazarus' name was written on the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, he had the gift of eternal life. And this rich man who was not named by name, uh, his name was not on the book of life, even though he had property and wealth and so forth. So he said, he, uh, he, Father Abraham says that he has, uh, that your, brother, your brethren have Moses and the prophets to hear them. And if they will not hear Moses and the prophets, which we all have access to Moses, that means the five, first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch uh, is the uh, writings of Moses. And we all have the words of the prophets of the Old Testament. At this time when Jesus was giving this, uh, uh, this expression to, to the people there about the afterlife, uh, the New Testament had not been written. So he's not gathering anything from the New Testament, but he is making the New Testament. This became a part of the New Testament, this dialogue between he and, and this wealthy person. So uh, uh, he, uh, he, he said that uh, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they would not hear one as though he were raised from the dead. Well, we would think that surely if someone that we uh, went to a viewing and we saw the person there in the casket and and they were buried and all of a sudden they come and knock on our door and said i want to tell you about the terrible things that will happen if you do not get redeemed if you do not claim jesus as your savior that we wouldn't give them an audience that we wouldn't pay attention to them we think well surely we would but this uh, as jesus told this this uh, story about what the afterlife is like, then uh, we come to realize that uh, there are people that are so captivated with their own little world that uh, they won't listen to the gospel. And, and if you'll go to any church and drive out into the community, you find people engaged in all kinds of activities surrounding the church. They may be uh, out in their yard uh, playing badminton or croquet or something like this. Uh, if we could open the door and walk in the house on Sunday morning, they may be getting that extra sleep that they've missed out on during the week. Uh, they may be uh, eating a late breakfast and uh, just lounging around. And at the same time, church services is going on. They have an opportunity to learn the truth of God's word, but instead of availing themselves to this, they're engaged in their own uh, lifestyle. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Are people seeking God when they never darken a church door, when they neglect such a great salvation as what God has provided through his son, Jesus Christ. And so uh, here they are. And so uh, Solomon was viewing a uh, life after death as being uh, going to uh, this place of darkness. And uh, he's saying, if you live a thousand years twice over, 2000 years, for example, if your life went on that long, and you were able to take in all of the things that this world could give you. When you die, you, you uh, and you, you do not live a good life. He said, you, you go, you all go to one place. In verse seven, he says, all the labor of men is for his mouth. 
and yet the appetite is not filled. Uh, who, who in the world is satisfied? As one man put it, he said, uh, you know, I don't want to own all the property in the world. He says, I, I just want the property that borders me. Well, what that means is you want all the property in the world. Because when you purchase property that is right next to you, then all of a sudden your borders are extended and a different neighbor's property is adjacent to you. And so you want that. And so those who are in the midst of wealth, uh, they are never satisfied. What is wealth? Every generation, I guess, has its own definition. I remember uh, when I was young, uh, if you were a millionaire, uh, meaning that basically your net worth was over a million dollars, uh, you would financially have it made. This was a wealthy individual. If you go back another couple of hundred years and uh, you look through the records of your relatives as an appraisal was made, and this always happened when somebody died, they sent uh, a couple of neighbors in to appraise the property. And the kinds of things that they appraised was like how many buttons that you had or how many handkerchiefs that you owned. And so the small things in life was was counted as as part of your wealth because people lived in log cabins with dirt floors uh, they uh, uh, they heated with uh, with wood in fireplaces so uh, you if you got warm you had to get close to the fireplace and rotate your body sort of like on a rotisserie uh, in order to uh, keep warm and uh, uh, 200 years ago if a man owned a loom that you could weave with, you were considered a wealthy person. And so the difference between wealth of that day and my childhood is a million dollars. But in our own time, those that are considered really wealthy are billionaires, not millionaires, but billionaires. Uh, to even make the top 300 uh, wealthiest people in America, you have to be a billionaire. And so uh, wh what wealth means is, is different to every generation. But what kind of satisfaction does wealth give you? Solomon was uh, an extremely wealthy person. He was a powerful person. Uh, he, had, uh, he had respect throughout the known world, but yet there was no satisfaction in his life. Uh, he, uh, he said that uh, uh, all the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. So he's saying his own appetite is not filled. He's never satisfied. He's never content. In verse 9, he says, Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. So he's saying, that which you can see, that which you can touch, that which you can experience is far better than, uh, than your constant wandering and desire for more. That, uh, because this just uh, keeps you weary all the time. You never get enough. I knew uh, a woman once who uh, basically defrauded her own mother out of her home. Uh, she, uh, she, uh, her mother was elderly and uh, uh, very poorly educated. She went uh, three years to school, about three months a year, uh, when her parents didn't need her at home. And this was uh, typical of a lot of women during that era because uh, it was thought that it's important that a man get an education, but it didn't make any difference whether a woman had an opportunity to get an education or not. And so uh, her sight wasn't great and her hearing wasn't great at this stage of life. And so uh, this daughter puts a legal document in front of her and says, you need to sign this. And she trusted her daughter and she signed it. And what she did is she signed away her home. And uh, this was found out later when she allowed the taxes to go delinquent. And when she allowed the taxes to go delinquent, uh, then uh, this woman was confronted about what she had done 
and she was uh, asked the question. This was a woman who uh, was already fairly wealthy, but she wanted her mother's house too. And she owned lots of rental property around in this community. And uh, so uh, she was asked, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you obviously have plenty of money. Why in the world did you want to steal your mother's house? And her answer was, you never know how much you might need. And so this is like Solomon. He says, the more you get, the more you want. You know, it's not wealth that corrupts a person. It's the love of money. You know, there are a lot of people who are wealthy who are not rich. And there are a lot of people who are rich that are not wealthy. Richness is the fullness of life, experiencing the good things that God wants us to experience. And some of the greatest of these is to be a giving person. It's what we share with others. It's what we do for others that enriches our lives. It's not what we gather unto ourselves. Uh, Solomon here talks about uh, uh, what good is it to gather all this because eventually uh, nobody will remember. And that's so true. You can go out into a lot of ancient cemeteries and grave sites are marked by field stones. There's no engraving on it. It's just a rock that's placed at the head and maybe another at the foot for a footstone. And the people who buried the person in that cemetery in that location uh, during their lifetime they remembered who the person was but after a generation or two you go to these rural country cemeteries on somebody's farm and there's grave after grave with no engraved tombstones nobody knows who's there except god god knows who is there god knows who is his and who is not and uh, so in verse 10, he says, that which hath been is named already. So, uh, you know, you can, you can go here around America and every road is named, practically every mountain is named, every river is named. Everything is already have, has received its name. Uh, when I was growing up, I think there were like 92 natural elements as far as the uh, periodic chart. Uh, and today, all the elements that are new are man-made. And uh, so uh, anything that is old has already been named. And uh, so uh, uh, here he's saying that uh, neither may he be content with him that is mightier than he. So the person who is, uh, is constantly looking for more and more if he sees somebody who is wealthier than what he is, he can't be content until he passes that person in wealth and in, in uh, property or uh, land or, or whatever. Uh, so he is never satisfied. In verse 11, he says, seeing that there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? So, <laughs> If you seek after vain things, things that, that have no real meaning, that uh, uh, after uh, someone dies, uh, what is it worth to the person who has left it? I remember a little story that says uh, uh, that uh, uh, these uh, people were visiting a funeral home, and uh, one said to the other, wonder how much he left. And the other person said, he left it all. And so that's what Solomon's saying. You know, you don't take any of it with you. You leave it all. In verse 12, which is the last verse of this chapter, he says, For who knoweth what is good for a man in his life? All the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? And so... Uh, here Solomon is talking about the brevity of life and the lack of meaning of life. But we've got uh, six more chapters to go. And in the last chapter, Solomon really comes to understand the important factors 
of life and what really brings meaning to life. And that's so important for us to grasp. So here he's in the midst of his wondering. And perhaps you're wondering what is the real meaning of life. The real meaning of life is following Jesus Christ. For it is more profitable to live godly in Christ Jesus, both in this world and in the world which is to come. He brings meaning to the here and now. He brings meaning to the hereafter. Let us bow for a word of prayer. God, our Father, we thank you that you have created this wondrous world that we can enjoy if we reach a position where uh, that we uh, constantly are striving for more and more when we don't really need more and more. We know, Lord, that you provide for our needs, but you don't always provide for our wants. And if our life is consumed with want, then we never find peace and joy and satisfaction. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us in this nation. You know, America it is such a prosperous nation, and we thank you that, that you have placed us here. You could just as easily place us in a third world country where life on a daily basis would be a struggle, but you have blessed us. And we thank you, Lord, for these blessings. And we pray for those that may have less than us. We pray that you would make them uh, wealthy, uh, even if they are not rich. So bless us, Lord, in all these ways, for we ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.